Before we get started, just a little reminder to subscribe to our channel and ring the notification bell so that you don't miss out on any of our new videos where we discuss our top tips for building a strong school list, getting into your dream schools, writing great essays, and so much more. Welcome everyone to another stream here at College Vine. I'm your host today, Elias Miller. What we're talking about today, uh, Dartmouth, home to fun traditions like running over a hundred laps around a bonfire, or perhaps doing the polar bear swim in Occam Pond during the winter. Now they may not seem particularly fun to you, but many Dartmouth students do swear by these traditions. Uh, what are we chatting about today? Just gonna try to walk through how to maximize your chances of acceptance uh, at Dartmouth. We will Dartmouth give a Uh, okay, what we'll be talking about today, well, we're going to go over some basic background about Dartmouth. We'll talk about admissions and admissions data at Dartmouth. We'll talk about how best to build your profile now in high school, I assume, uh, to set yourself up to get in. We'll talk about how to uh, write essays. Okay, some basic overview info about Dartmouth. Well, it's located in Hanover, New Hampshire. That's in the northwest part of New Hampshire. Um, it's sort of a rural location in New Hampshire's Upper Valley, right along the Connecticut River in the White Mountains and right on the border of Vermont. It's the ninth oldest institution of higher education in the U.S. It is, of course, one of the Ivies, and it's by far the smallest Ivy in terms of total student population. Uh, it's ranked number 13 by U.S. News. It's well known for its very strong liberal arts tradition and also its commitment to undergraduate education. Its acceptance rate last year was only 8.7%, and of course that also includes athletes and legacies who have a substantially better chance at acceptance than the rest of us. If you're not an athlete or legacy, your real acceptance rate goes down below 8.7%. Dartmouth College does refuse to call itself a university due to its focus on liberal arts and college programs, although it does have some graduate programs, including graduate students. It's made up of 6,350 students in five different colleges. Dartmouth students enjoy doing lots of outdoorsy stuff and tend to refer to Dartmouth as being in the middle of nowhere, which of course isn't a bad thing if you've spent any time in the White Mountains as I have. Dartmouth also well known for its very, very heavy Greek life presence with over 60% of students being involved in Greek life. I've heard that Greek life there is very inclusive and uh, that the frat houses and the like do allow all non-freshman Dartmouth students into their spaces for parties and the like, which is you know better than some of the universities that have more exclusive frat or other social club organizations, but you know still very, very strong social club experience there at Dartmouth. Okay, what are the different schools? The five schools at Dartmouth are Arts and Sciences, the Thayer School of Engineering, the School of Medicine, the School of Business, and the School of Graduate and Advanced Studies. Um, Thayer does have uh, an undergraduate degree program as well as graduate degree programs, and then Medicine, Business, and of course, Graduate and Advanced Studies. Those are just graduate schools. If you're an undergraduate, you'll be either in Thayer or in the School of Arts and Sciences. So how does Dartmouth break down? Well, of course, the admissions rate is 8.7%. How does that look in total numbers? Well, last year, there were 21,392 applicants, of whom 1,973 were accepted at such a tiny number. Uh, and of course, fewer than that actually ended up attending. Dartmouth total undergraduate admissions is only like 4,400, right? So it's about uh, 1,100 um, a year, so some of the people who Dartmouth accepted it didn't end up coming, as is often the case. Uh, most of these competitive schools do give athletes and legacies admission priority. So at Dartmouth, about one-fifth of the student body comprises varsity athletes. One of the lowest percentage um, of legacy enrollments out of the Ivy League uh, at Dartmouth, um, it's still about 10%. Uh, of, of the class's legacy, but that's actually lower than most places. So legacy possibly not quite as critical at Dartmouth as at some of the other Ivies. Of course, if you're not legacy, if you're not an athlete, the actual acceptance rate is lower. It's very, very hard to get in. How does admissions break down? We estimate here at College Vine that about 45% of admissions are made up with your academics, meaning your GPA, your grades, test scores as well, uh, and your course rigor. That's gonna be the largest chunk of your applications and what counts the most in the process. 25% will be how you respond to your essays, um, of course, how well written they are, how much they share about you, if you have clearly shown that you've done your research and have a real interest in attending Dartmouth, and also if you're able to um, show that you'd be a good fit for Dartmouth, that you would excel there, make the most of your, of your opportunities, 
Um, schools, of course, are looking for people to show up and take advantage of every opportunity they are offered. 20% um, would be your extracurricular profile, which could um, you could show in your uh, extracurricular resume on Common App, which you could also talk about in your essays, and also possibly your recommenders might talk about some of your extracurriculars. And 10% is just an other category, including, uh, I don't know, some random things uh, like interviews, uh, recommendation letters, all that good stuff. Of course, this is not set in stone. Dartmouth isn't saying, you know, 45% here and using a calculator to give you a score probably. But uh, at Dartmouth and at schools like this, this is basically the breakdown, at least how we've estimated it with our data. This is about how it works. How about academic qualifications? Um, well, of course, they're the largest component of the admissions process at Dartmouth and schools like Dartmouth, about 45%. That's just trying to decide if you're academically qualified with some adjustment for your background, right? They're gonna compare you to other people who match your background, whether they're from the same place or uh, you know, something like that. Um, there's some, you know, some demographic adjustment. There is a bit of an academic index, which is sort of a composite score that represents both your GPA and your standardized test scores. This is created, you know, Dartmouth admissions officers create this academic in, uh, index and it very slightly uh, from college to college, but Dartmouth admissions officers will use that academic index as a cutoff point. If your GPA and or your SAT or ACT are below a certain level, sort of below that 25th percentile by any kind of significant margin, then you really won't be considered for admission at Dartmouth, and Dartmouth admissions officers will probably put your application in a throwaway pile without even reading your essays or checking out your extracurriculars. So it's definitely in your best interest to make sure that you fit within or above that academic cutoff in terms of your standardized test scores and GPA. Uh, and if you're worried about what that cutoff is, don't worry, we'll talk about it in a moment. How does this Dartmouth student body break down demographically? Well, you can see it about above, about 62% of Dartmouth's current students identify as white or Caucasian, 23% uh, identify as Asian or Asian American, 11% identify as black or African American, and 12% identify as Hispanic or Latinx. How about gender? Uh, sorry, this graphic is just for the incoming class. You can see a very, very close split uh, between um, people who identify as men and people who identify as women. As you can see on this graph, there is a very, very small number of students uh, from the class of 2024 who self-identified as non-binary or as gender queer on their application. Do note that, that this isn't necessarily an accurate estimation for the total size of the community. Uh, and also we're talking about very small numbers because of course the entire class is very small. Um, the number within the full student body, not just the freshman class, may be much higher than this 0.6%. How about the geography? Dartmouth does have a significant number of international students, 12% on par with a lot of other elite schools, although it's not a huge number, right? We looked at some schools last week, I wanna see USC, uh, that had numbers of uh, international uh, students in the in the 20s, in the 20, 20 something percent, yeah? But, uh, so of course, the majority of Dartmouth students will be domestic. If you're an international applicant, you're gonna really need to work to make your application stand out, but uh, it's definitely possible to get into Dartmouth as an, as an international student. And finally, where do Dartmouth students break down geographically? Well, as you can see, the largest component of Dartmouth students do come from New England and the Mid-Atlantic. Schools typically do accept the most students from within their direct geographic region. It's no surprise that the West is a slightly smaller cohort, but again, fairly even at Dartmouth uh, in terms of uh, population centers and which ones they're, they're drawing from. We talked about academics a little bit. Let's talk about extracurriculars. Ideally, your extracurriculars line up with your intended major. That's to say, if you're applying to Dartmouth as a computer science major, we're hoping that your extracurriculars clearly demonstrate and prove your interest and success in computer science, right? So if you're applying as a computer science major, well, hopefully you've done a couple hackathons, you've taken some computer science courses, maybe you've coded an app, maybe you've done some competitive coding competitions, or maybe Cyber Patriot if you're into cybersecurity or the like. Um, you know, in the same way that if you're applying to study piano performance at a conservatory, we hope that you've, you know, have some significant accomplishments as a pianist, whether that's in competitions or going to different festivals, playing in master classes, etc. Um, having your, being able to back up your intended major in your extracurriculars uh, profile and also in your essays is really, really critical for building a strong uh, applications 
profile. Of course, also you'll want to use your extracurricular profile to demonstrate your passion for your extracurricular activities and hobbies. You'll maybe be able to demonstrate consistency if there's certain activities you've pursued for many years. And uh, in the line with consistency, also your commitment. Perhaps you can also demonstrate uniqueness, which will go a long way to showing the authenticity of your application and also making your application more memorable, which is important because admissions officers are people, my friends. Uh, they are not robots or algorithms. They are in fact people who are influenced emotionally by your writing. And if you're unique and specific and true to yourself, then you know your real personality will come through. You'll build that kind of virtual connection with your admissions officer, which is so critical in your admissions and in your applications to uh, very selective schools like Dartmouth. How about college essays? Well, they do make up about 25% of your college application. At Dartmouth, you'll be writing two supplemental essays. This is in addition to your Common App essay, of course. They are each between 100 and 300 words. These essays represent the most personal component of your application. You can use them to discuss who you are, what you care about, how you respond to different informations. Basically, you're giving admissions officers at Dartmouth a real sense for who you are, why you do the things you do, how you developed your interests, how you hope to pursue them in the future. Admissions officers really want to root for you. They want to read really unique and uh, interesting and thought-provoking essays. They want to read about applications from people who they think would be amazing additions to the student body. These essays are often the deciding moment for whether or not you get in. There are so many applicants with great GPAs, great SAT and ACT scores, and rigorous course loads who apply to Dartmouth every year. The essays are oftentimes a deciding component. Of course, the two essays at Dartmouth, one of them is a Why Dartmouth essay, which you'll want to do some research to make sure you know exactly why you want to attend Dartmouth. The second is a pick your own essay prompt, uh, and we'll go through each of the possible prompts. Maybe we'll even do some examples. We'll see how much time we have as we continue on. How about other variables? This is just kind of a 10% bucket. Sometimes the recognition of your high school can, um, can factor in. Sometimes having a lot of students from your high school apply to Dartmouth might be bad for your chances, especially if some of them are very qualified or are being recruited as athletes or are legacy. Some schools have feeder relationships with colleges. I always think of the example at Harvard as being Boston Latin School. Boston BLS, of course, has a, a real relationship with Harvard where they're sending, you know, 10, 20, 25 students each year to Harvard. That's really a feeder relationship. If you go there, you have a better chance of getting into Harvard almost automatically. There are other parts of your identity that might play into your considerations. The way that you write about them uh, in your essays can also help admissions officers get a better sense for who you are, what kind of struggles you've had, maybe things that you overcame. We've only listed a few here, but there are many other things that can make your identity unique. These are parts of your application that you have little or no control over. We can't speak exactly on how or in what ways or to what degree these factors influence your decisions. We're just aware that there are slight demographic adjustments for certain other variables in the considerations. How does the admissions process work at Dartmouth? Well, you've got a primary reader. That's the first person to check out your profile and your application. That person is probably responsible for all the applicants within your geographic area. Uh, and that person will determine whether or not they're gonna put your application sort of more in a throwaway pile because maybe you don't meet the academic threshold, kind of informal cutoffs at Dartmouth, or they may decide that you know they believe in you and they want to advocate for you and then we'll go on to secondary readers, uh, three or four more readers at Dartmouth, you'll need to win these people over, uh, just like your primary reader. And eventually, your primary and secondary readers, hopefully, will vouch for you in front of the larger admissions committee, which is uh, when the application is presented. Uh, and uh, of course, um, it's mostly your secondary readers advocating that for you there in front of the admissions committee, although your primary reader may also play a role. That's why it's so important to, to win over those secondary readers though. The committee will ultimately decide whether they're gonna waitlist you, accept you, reject you, or if you've applied early decision, whether they're gonna defer you, which means that they'll consider you in the regular pool. If anyone here was deferred, if you applied to Dartmouth early and you were deferred and you're still interested in going, I would strongly recommend you actually write a letter of continued interest to make sure that the admissions officers know that you're still serious about attending. You'll want to uh, explain all the great things you've been up to and all the things you've accomplished since you initially applied. Uh, that'll make sure that you know you do have a real chance at, at getting in and regular. That said, if you've been deferred after applying early, um, your chances are rather lower, but not impossible and not unheard of. I had some students who actually got into really great schools, including Georgia Tech, 
and maybe MIT, definitely Georgia Tech, uh, uh, had definitely had some students who got into good schools after being uh, deferred early. Admissions profile. How do you build a strong admissions profile that can maximize your chances at Dartmouth? We're going to talk about building your profile through high school. We're going to talk about how to write the essays. And of course, you're going to have to apply and you're going to have to get lucky. Probably admissions are incredibly selective at schools like Dartmouth and may come down to somewhat arbitrary decisions, unfortunately, because so many people are qualified to attend Dartmouth and schools like Dartmouth. Don't worry. We'll talk about all this stuff in a moment. What SAT scores, what ACT scores should you be sending? Uh, okay, so the middle 50% of accepted students at Dartmouth had between a 1440 and a 1560. If you have significantly lower than a 1440, you may want to consider not attending. I would talk about 60 points off that, maybe factoring a little bit for demographics. Again, remember, you're going to be compared against other people in your demographic cohort. So if, for instance, you're an Asian American applicant, you're going to be considered against other Asian American applicants. Uh, unfortunately, you're going to need a slightly higher SAT score than the equivalent Caucasian or white applicant to get in to these really selective schools. This is just a known fact, unfortunately. Um, but so, you know, a little bit of factoring in for those extenuating circumstances and demographic information. But if you have 60 points below the SAT or, you know, two to three points below the low end of the ACT, uh, so that that would be in this case, you know, below a 1380 on the on the SAT or below a 3029 on the ACT. In that range, you may want to consider not submitting. But if you're in this range or close to this range, we at College Vine would recommend that you do submit. How did the SAT breakdown work? Well, the EBRW or evidence-based reading and writing scores were within the 710 through 770 range. That's 25th percentile through 75th percentile. And uh, the middle 50th percentile for ACT um, of course, legacies and athletes have lower average stats since they don't need as high scores for admissions. And of course, legacies and athletes are factored into these 50% estimations. Basically, you'll need slight, even slightly more selective scores to get in if you're not legacy or an athlete. How about subject tests? SAT twos, you may all be wondering. Well, they are not required this year at Dartmouth. They can help if you have some good ones. Of course, you'd want to cater your test to your possible major, right? If you're going to pursue economics, hopefully you've taken the math too. If you're going to pursue history, hopefully you've taken the US history SAT2 or the world history SAT2. But that said, it really doesn't matter. It's totally optional this year. Don't worry if you don't have time. Don't worry if they're not offered because of COVID. It's not a big deal. It's just a bonus if you have them. They may become slightly more important again in future years after COVID, but on average during the past years, uh, SAT2s have become increasingly less important in your admissions profile. How about grade point average? 94% of admittees in the top 10% of their high school graduating class. You're going to aim for as high as possible a GPA with the most rigorous courses available. Ideally, you want a 3.9 or a 4.0, really a 4.0. It is okay if you had a rough start in high school, though, as long as you demonstrate a really good upward trajectory throughout high school, your grades have gotten much, much better over the course of high school. That'll look good as well for college admissions officers. Uh, of course, if you want to make sure that your profile is strong enough for Dartmouth, you know, obviously you can calculate your chances by signing up for a free account here on collegevine.com and then, uh, you know, input all your information into our profile. We'll pop out really refined estimates of your chancing at hundreds of schools in the country. How about extracurriculars? Well, your extracurricular profile is your chance to demonstrate excellence within a particular domain. Of course, at schools like Dartmouth, you really want to focus on leadership positions because these will show initiative, drive, and leadership. And of course, Dartmouth is looking for future world leaders. You'll want some high-level awards with which quantify and show exactly how excellent your achievements are, impressive projects as well. What are some examples of each? Well, leadership positions might be student council president or the founder of a club, but they could also be the treasurer or the vice president or whatever. How about impressive projects? Well, maybe you coded your own website. Maybe you started a volunteer pipeline. Maybe you create a nonprofit or published a book. All of those things would look really, really, really impressive and can help make up for slightly lower GPA and or SAT scores. Okay. Let's talk about essays. <laughs> Prompt one, while arguing a Dartmouth-related case before the U.S. Supreme Court in 1818, Daniel Webster, class of 1801, delivered this memorable line, it is, sir, a small college, and yet there are those who love it. As you seek admission to the class of 2024, 
what aspects of the college's program, community, or campus environment attract your interest. So this is a standard Y School X essay. It's very, very short, only 100 words. You're barely going to have time to say anything. You'll want to tie in your current interest and experience to specific university offerings, right? So you do want to name drop professors, programs, and classes, but you don't just want to name drop them and then continue on and have a bunch of things. You want to go into detail, right? If you're going to mention a specific class you want to take, you have to say why you want to take that, if it's going to expand your mind in new ways, if it's going to allow you to take an interdisciplinary approach to your given fields, if it's going to be really important for your career and for you to achieve your career goals, these kinds of things. Explain to us why it will be meaningful to take that specific course. Same thing if there's a specific research program you're going to take part in or a specific internship to which you'll, you'll apply, a specific extracurricular in which you hope to participate. Don't just list them. Do list them, but also explain why exactly that experience will be meaningful to you and is important to you in your academic career. Of course, we've got a blog post on this, which is titled How to Write the Dartmouth College Essays 2020-21. Okay, what's next? Well, six prompts for some tips on how to choose one. Read through each prompt first, see if any of them grab attention. You can categorize into three segments, you know, put likely, possible, or unlikely next to each of those prompts. You can jot down ideas for the likely or possible prompts, review them, check them over, select the topic with the most unique story and the most memorable and exciting personal narrative, or the one that best showcases your wit and intellectual prowess. You'll want to mention Dartmouth specific opportunities in these essays, but don't let it overlap with prompt one. If you've already listed a particular professor or research opportunity in essay one, don't include them again in your essay two. With these tips in mind, let us dive into the six prompts. The first, the Hawaiian word mo'olelo is often translated as story, but it can also refer to history, legend, genealogy, and tradition. Use one of these translations to introduce yourself. So this is a, you know, a chance for you to narrate a defining moment in your life. Um, you want to look into your history, look at your family, academic, or employment, or recreational history to choose a moment. Or you can look into culture and folklore or your ancestry to find a story that's important to you. Uh, or you can use a family anecdote or, or an heirloom to, uh, to uh, use as a jumping off point. Do you want to make sure that you say something profound and interesting and exciting about yourself uh, and make sure that it's not vague or general but deeply specific and personal to you because <clears throat> that'll help your application be memorable it'll help you stand out make a connection with your admissions officers number two what excites you this could be a more creative essay although they all can be creative it's a real chance for you to showcase your personality for you to discuss a passion or a hobby perhaps it's a chance for you to humanize your application you can definitely be self-deprecating if you want don't be too self-deprecating though uh, because you want to present yourself in, a, in the best possible light, but without bragging, of course. Take a risk. Uh, you know, feel free to, to do a more creative response. Make sure that you only talk about one thing. If you talk about all the things that excite you, you're not going to get into enough detail. <clears throat> We'd recommend really focusing on one. Number three. In The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, William Kumquamba, class of 2014, reflects on constructing a windmill from recycled materials to power the electrical appliances in his family's Malawian house. If you want to make it, all you have to do is try. What drives you to create, and what do you hope to make, or have you already made? So this is your chance to show what drives you to create. It's a good particular essay topic for any of you who are interested in uh, engineering specifically, or you can pick a passion for a certain topic or a certain cause, or you know something artistic if you're more on the creative artistic side and uh, things inspired you to create. So there's many different ways to take this prompt and many different reasons you might select it. If you've created something you're proud of, whether that's you know writing a novel, creating an invention, building an app, developing a website, whatever it may be, we highly recommend you do uh, use this prompt to talk about your creation you can talk about specific departments or courses that you hope to take advantage of at Dartmouth that will help you build your knowledge, uh, build onto your existing knowledge, and maybe you know achieve your career interests and life goals in relation to that area. Dartmouth prompt number four. Curiosity is a guiding element of Toni Morrison's talent as a writer. I feel totally curious and alive and in control and almost magnificent when I write, she says. Celebrate your curiosity. This is super open-ended. You can choose an anecdote about something that sparked your curiosity. 
You could write a love letter to something that sparks your curiosity. Don't oversimplify your answer. Make sure you really deeply reflect and ruminate on it. Say something poetic or powerful or meaningful to you. Dartmouth essay prompt number five. Everything changes, everything moves, everything revolves, everything flies and goes away, observed Frida Kahlo. Apply Kahlo's perspective to your own life. Of course, when you write this essay, you'll want to focus on specific events or topics. You'll want to focus on how an experience has impacted your life goals. You'll want to try to be creative when you respond to this prompt. And do make sure to qualify the impact of this perspective. You know, don't say that you changed your whole life around the first time you heard this quote, or you know, you don't need to say that you live by this philosophy or this philosophy impacts everything you do. Just try to use this quote as a lens to look at something in your life or apply it to a situation you've been in. Obviously, her quote is about transience and the, the nature of transience and the nature of, of time and evolution and things. So I'm sure this could apply in many ways to any of us and to any of the things that we do or hope to accomplish. Dartmouth option number six. In the aftermath of World War II, Dartmouth President John Sloan Dickey, class of 1929, proclaimed, the world's troubles are your troubles and there is nothing wrong with the world that better human beings cannot fix. Which of the world's troubles inspires you to act? How might your course of study at Dartmouth prepare you to address it? So this is a chance for you to discuss a current political, social, climate, scientific issue about which you're passionate. It's also a chance for you to explain why addressing this challenge is motivating you to pursue an education specifically at Dartmouth. Make sure that you clearly articulate what the specific trouble is. It doesn't need to be huge in scale. Uh, it could be something small. Um, make sure you explain to the reader how you plan to address the problem with potential actions, tools, etc. And maybe also, um, or no, specifically also how the specific courses you'll take at Dartmouth, the extracurriculars in which you participate, the research opportunities of which you'll take advantage, how will all those experiences and uh, uh, parts of your education better enable you to deal with this trouble? Again, it's actually really good for you to to make the problem slightly specific. So for instance, uh, if you know global climate change is such a big issue, I might, you know, if you're interested in addressing global climate change, pick a certain part of it that you think you could maybe fix or help solve at a local or perhaps national level and, and focus on that because it'll make uh, your essay a little bit stronger and it'll make your goals a little more achievable and less kind of broadly or vaguely ambitious. Uh, okay, of course, also there's your Common App essays. Those are in there. Um, and uh, we've got a sample essay. Uh, I'll read it aloud to you and then we'll talk about why it's good. My earliest memory is spinning in circles with folk dancers in a flurry of gold, red, and green embroidered on black dresses. We weren't in a dance hall, but in a gymnasium, twirling on three-point arcs and free throw lines. The Bohemian Hall has tons of contradictions like that. In their beer garden, they serve chicken schnitzel and buffalo chicken wings, macaroni and cheese, and tachinka, or head cheese. Happy drunken 20-somethings pass by, little kids, and nobody thinks anything of it. Like the Bohemian Hall, the apartment complex I grew up in had its own contradictions. Our Czech landlord Yardo was the stereotypical Slavic badass from the movies. Chatting up a crowd drinking their umpteenth pilsners, he insulted a tenant that dared complain about asbestos in, the part in his apartment. After all, asbestos only spreads if you cut the old pipes. Hung on the wall of Yardo's basement were works of all shapes and sizes, from the lush rolling hills of the Moravian landscapes to the curves of the female body in suggestive poses. Yardo smelled of cigarettes and beer, which my mom told me to avoid at all costs. I wonder why she befriended him. But then I realized that he reminded her of home. We couldn't go to the Bohemian Hall every day, but we could always go to Yardo's basement and talk Czechoslovak celebrity gossip. I am constantly brought back to my Slovak heritage, but as influenced by my American lifestyle. I eat goulash at Thanksgiving dinner, speak a mix of English and Slovak, Slovglish, with my great aunt, and say na travi instead of cheers when I drink champagne on New Year's Day. My Slovak American heritage was, and always will be, perfectly contradictory. So I hope you enjoyed uh, the example. The essay is, is deeply, deeply personal, right? It's extremely memorable. It'll stick in your head because the details are poignant and so specific. 
I think it's a deeply effective essay. I'm assuming this is a response to essay prompt number one. It's very effective and it's effective because it's not only well-written and pleasurable to read, but also because it's so specific to the applicant uh, and thus unique and memorable. And anyone can make their, you know, even if you think you haven't done anything unique, no one has the exact same life experiences that you do. So if you're able to talk really specifically about your experiences, that will make you unique. No need to worry. If you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel and ring the notification bell below so you don't miss one of our new videos. Um, also, you know, share the video with your friends if you enjoyed it.